The internet has been off all over the country for almost a week now. You never realized how many aspects of your daily life relied on that connection. You wonder how many times during the day your mother has tried to message you to make sure that you are safe. But the messages never come through. And without social media updates, there is no way to know where the military crackdown is intensifying and which streets to take to avoid running into danger. Your government claims that what it's doing is legal, that they are following the letter of the law. Could you perhaps make an argument against this claim? Could you prove that the internet shutdown is in fact illegal, unconstitutional, and fundamentally undemocratic? If you could make that case, would they really let you win? Welcome to Kill Switch, a podcast series brought to you by Access Now, the Keep It On Coalition, co-sponsored by Internews, and produced by Volume. I am your host, Felicia Antonio. In this six-part series, we want to highlight the troubling rise of a new form of anti-democratic oppression spreading across the world. Government-created internet shutdowns. We will be hearing from journalists, activists, and experts who have been fighting to keep the internet on, all the way from the high courts of Sudan to the rural regions of Pakistan. Today, we take a look at what happens when you decide to take your government or even your telecom service provider to court in a desperate effort to get an internet shutdown stopped. In December 2018, the citizens of Sudan took to the streets in a series of protests over the rising price of food. It ended with a military coup d'etat and a massive loss of life in the capital city of Khartoum. We talked to Shahad Azim, whose father, Abdul Azim Hassan, lives in Khartoum. Yeah, I was in South Africa at the time. My dad was in Sudan and many of my friends were in Sudan. Shahad recounts the progressive shutdown of the internet in 2018 starting with a social media blackout? Um, The social media block started uh, in December 2018, when the revolution started. The revolution first started in Adbara, the city of Adbara, in one of the northern cities of Sudan, and then spread around the cities of Sudan. There was no any kind of warning, but the fact that people were um, organizing, sending publishers about the... Um, revolution or we are planning to go out on a protest tomorrow at half past one, um, get ready. That means that expect um, a social media shutdown or a total shutdown um, of the internet. The authoritarian government of Omar al-Bashir, who had been in power for 30 years, was wary of such a social media protest. The same type of protest that unseated Gaddafi in Libya and Mubarak in Egypt during the Arab Spring. If I'm speaking about the period from December 2018 to the 26th of February 2019, that was a social media interruption, which you are still allowed to use um, the internet if you had your VPN on. But from um, the 3rd of June, which is the massacre um, of 2019, uh, people were unable to use um, internet at all. It was it was a total shutdown. There was no any type of access to internet, and it continued for a period of thirty seven days. During the social media blackout, Omar al Bashir's generals saw an opening for a power grab and unseated al Bashir in a military coup d'état. 
the de facto leader became Hamdan Dagalo, also known as Hemeti. It was a mass protest on the 6th of April. Al-Bashir was ousted on the 11th of April and the sit-in continued. So it started as a mass protest, continued as a sit-in, and this sit-in continued for a period of three months till the 3rd of um, June, when on the 3rd of June, the morning of the 3rd of June, which was the last day of Ramadan, um, this, the people woke up under the sounds of guns and um, the militias. And on that day, we lost um, hundreds, actually 700 are injured and hundreds are lost, according to Amnesty International. The events shocked the world. And the new military government's immediate reaction was to flip the kill switch. On the 3rd of June, exactly at 11 a.m., there was a total shutdown of the internet. And um, the reaction of the people was conflicted because many of the people had losses like their either neighbor or someone. Everyone was involved in this, in the sit-in. Um, I woke up with a phone call from a friend and she said they are um, <clears throat> they are attacking people in the sit down and I woke up around 4 o'clock and I was watching a live video and then the live video was interrupted it was a Facebook for live video <clears throat> and then I wasn't able to get any type of correspondences from Sudan or know about anyone my dad was there at the time and I wasn't able to know if they were fine or what's happening. Fortunately, Shahad's father was safe. So it was a big shock to us not being able to even send SMS because the internet block extended to the, um, reached the extent that people outside Sudan were unable to send SMS um, SMSs to Sudan. Um, it, we were all worried. Um, well, till Mr. Rescuer came in 10 days later, on the 13th of June, my dad instituted his personal action against Zain, which is one of the three giant telco providers in Sudan. Shahad's father, Abdulazim Hassan, is a renowned lawyer in Sudan. Um, well, my father is a Sudanese lawyer, activist, human rights fighter, and he has practices around Sudan, um, Bahrain, and Dubai. My dad instituted his action against Zain because Zain is his um, personal um, provider. Um, the technicality of the case is he instituted an action on a contractual basis on the fact that I've entered into a service contract with Zain where they have an obligation to provide me with internet connection and provide me with their full services in return of um, the payment of um, monthly fees. And he claimed in his um, pleadings, in one of his pleadings, he mentioned that uh, I am a lawyer and I have a list of clients that I have to be in contact with. I am a publisher and a journalist. Um, I need to continue my daily correspondences. And he mentioned the fact that Zayn um, arbitrarily violated his um, rights and um, violated their contractual obligations by not fulfilling their action. And he simply asked the court for a specific performance in terms of the contract and reserve his right to compensation in terms of the days that he was unconnected to the internet. On July 10th, more than a month after the shutdown, internet access was restored throughout Sudan once again. A catalyst for this was the court's order to the telecom companies, a result of Hassan's daring legal action. As soon as my dad saw that his case is going to be granted on his, in his favor, he, before the 23rd, he started his um, class action. He spread the word to one of the news um, outlets and he told them that he's getting his internet connection back. He contacted some of his friends and relatives, to, saying, um, planning on um, instituting a class action against them and other the other companies. And whoever wants to join um, will be sending a list. Provide your cell phone number and your full names, and we are proceeding with a class action. 
And he did. He did proceed with a class action. And it didn't take long till the 9th of July, as I mentioned. And he got a decision against Zain to return, um, to uplift the internet shutdown. And against MTN and Sudani or Sudatel um, on the 3rd of September. Yeah, when he got the internet back, he called us. He was like, did you notice that I called you using WhatsApp, not using um, the usual, unusual, normal phone call? Then I was like, no, I didn't notice. Then I looked at the phone and then I was like, yes, uh, he got the internet back. And then he sent us a picture of him standing in front of the court. What Hassan's story highlights is that we often only point fingers at dictators, authoritarian or military governments as the aggressors of internet shutdowns. But what about the international and private companies that are often complicit in these kinds of oppressive actions? We can always say that the president was set. Yes, we can say that. There will always be the awareness that ha- that came with the with the case, with um, the case of Abdul Azim Hassan versus Zain, and would always give the people a hope of claiming their rights. Access Now has been tracking legal actions that challenge shutdowns since 2015. These include petitions, lawsuits, appeals, and other court actions against telecom companies and governments. In our most recent efforts, we recorded 17 cases in 10 countries, spanning all the way from Russia to India to Cameroon. Um, my name is Natalia Krapiva and I'm Tech Legal Counsel at Access Now. Um, I'm currently based in Berlin, Germany. Natalia works with Access Now's Digital Security Helpline. Which is basically a helpline that provides 24-7 digital security assistance to civil society. And I also work on our legal arm. Uh, which is uh, leading our inter- strategic litigation work. And what I mean by that is that um, we don't bring legal actions ourselves in court typically, but we do support and often intervene in uh, legal actions brought by others. Uh, so we do that as either friends of the court or experts or in some other capacity. The work Natalia does focuses on using the legal system to challenge internet shutdowns. This is because governments often use the legal system as a way to legitimize these shutdowns, both within their own countries and to the international community. Uh, Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the General Comment 34 Um, They say that no restrictions on freedom of speech should be imposed, including internet shutdowns, um, unless uh, they're based in law, uh, they're necessary and proportionate to the goal that the restrictions are meant to achieve. And so, in other words, uh, before deciding to shut down uh, the internet in order to stop fake news or discourage school exam cheating, the government officials are supposed to ask themselves, are my actions based in uh, existing law? Are they truly necessary? Uh, and if so, would there be a less harmful step that could be more effective to achieve whatever it is I'm trying to achieve? Uh, but in reality, governments just don't immediately rush uh, to the so-called kill switch to just immediately shut down the internet without doing any of that legally required analysis. And so when challenging court, they just tend to think that throwing in sort of these generic words like national security or public safety uh, will sort of provide them a blanket justification for their actions. But as we have seen, the courts again and again are starting to tell these governments 
not so fast <laughs> and, and holding them uh, accountable and, and striking down these actions and laws as, as unlawful. Because the legal justifications governments often give for these shutdowns are so weak, with some international coordination between the Keep It On coalition members, organizations have seen a lot of success when challenging shutdowns in courts. Since the time that we started monitoring legal actions challenging shutdowns since 2015, uh, we have seen a number of court victories. So in 2016, we saw a victory in Pakistan where Islamabad High Court ruled shutdowns as unconstitutional. Uh, then in 2018, we had a couple of cases in India. They were uh, both related to uh, education. There was a shutdown during school exams and another one in a girls' hostel. And both courts ruled that the shutdowns were, in fact, unlawful. Uh, then in 2019, we also had a couple of victories in different uh, regions in Zimbabwe and then in Sudan. And then this year, we had two big victories as well. And Access Now has intervened in both of, the, of these cases as friends of the court. So in June, uh, we saw Indonesia court uh, that ruled that internet shutdowns in Papua and West Papua regions they were illegal and uh, basically not based in, in law. And similarly, in July, the ECOWAS court or the Economic Community of West African States court, it also ruled that shutdowns in that case during anti-government protests in Togo were also unlawful. But despite successful legal action to reinstate internet connection, sometimes the letter of the law doesn't hold up to the power of a willful government. Bringing cases are challenging in countries, I think, where uh, the judiciary systems are not sufficiently independent or sort of tend to defer and not challenge um, the decisions issued by the executive power. Uh, and so, for example, um, in, in Russia last year, uh, Russia, which is notorious for its judicial system being quite deferential to the executive power, uh, especially in cases dealing with national security. Uh, so in that case, the uh, Ingushetia court uh, declined to accept shutdowns uh, of internet, mobile internet during protests as uh, unlawful. Similarly, in Kashmir, we also kind of see this ongoing battle with some small victories and some losses. And uh, the courts there seem to be also sort of deferring to the government's interest without uh, sufficient scrutiny. But a success in one country often helps set an international legal precedent. With each victory, it becomes more and more difficult to legally justify internet shutdowns. Uh, one of the cases that particularly stands out for me is the Togo uh, decision by the ECOWAS court. Um, and so in that case, uh, the internet uh, shutdowns uh, were implemented during a protest and government demonstrations in September 2017. And there was excessive use of force by the government. There were a number of people injured and killed, unfortunately. And so uh, the government uh, also implemented shutdowns as this was happening. A number of nonprofit organizations led by Amnesty International Togo and Media Defense, they filed a lawsuit uh, with the ECOWAS court uh, challenging the shutdown. Access Now also participate. We led a coalition of eight organizations to also submit a brief and explain the court, the, the sort of the, the international legal standards applicable to this case. And uh, yeah, so the, the court ruled that the national security justifications for the shutdowns uh, that the government of Togo gave uh, were just inadequate, that the shutdown was not based in law, and that uh, Togo should, in fact, take steps in the future to ensure that the right to Internet access and the freedom of expression are protected. And the decision also sort of reaffirms the international um, standards in, related to shutdown is that Internet is, is a right uh, and it's enabler of other human rights and it deserves uh, protection under the law. When we win a shutdown case in one corner of the world, 
Lawyers and judges can look to that as an example of how to proceed legally in a case specific to their country. The Togo uh, decision by the ECOWAS court, uh, it's significant both because it was the most recent case that we've had and also because it becomes a precedent not only for the government of Togo, but also for other 14 members of the economic community of West African states. We should also remember that the law can be wielded against digital rights. In Indonesia, legislation used to crack down on online defamation, pornography and cyber crimes by President Joko Widodo's government has given a lot of power to the government to prosecute journalists and critics as well. My name is Damar Juniarto. I am the executive director of Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network. Uh, right now, I'm based in Jakarta. Our office is based in Bali. A lot of uh, members of SafeNet is based in more than 20 cities in Indonesia and the region. The Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network, known as SafeNet, is a digital rights organization that started in 2013. They operate throughout Southeast Asia focusing especially on internet laws and how they impact the digital rights of people in the region. Uh, Indonesia already have internet law since 2008 and we have a problematic internet law since the internet laws is curbing the freedom of expression and also freedom uh, from fear. In the first year when we began in 2013, we already saw the trend that internet laws is being misused by the public officials. They used to send uh, journalists, activists, and also uh, people who criticize the government to the jail. This is the result of what Dharma calls rubber articles in the law. Vaguely written laws that can be interpreted by the government in any way that it sees fit at a given moment in time. Laws like these become powerful tools for the government to justify persecuting anyone who disagrees with them. Seven years after 2013, the number of the people being sent to jail because they are expressing themselves through the medium of internet is growing very high. According to Dama and SafeNet, there are now more than 7,000 people being investigated by the police simply for statements they've made online. Dama has been fighting for digital rights in Indonesia for over seven years as director of SafeNet. It's been an ongoing battle to get the laws revised to ensure that they become more just and fair. Whenever the judicial review is not enough, we have to do some other things like challenging the law to the administrative court. That's what uh, we facing in 2019 whenever we we have internet shutdown. That year, there were three internet shutdowns in Indonesia as the government started utilizing the kill switch. The first case was in May 2019. This was after the general elections, when protests erupted after there were accusations of vote rigging. At that time, they were doing bandwidth throttling, so we cannot send pictures and also videos through the instant messaging and also social media. And then the second internet shutdown that happening in 2019 is in Papua and West Papua. It were two times. And the reason why the government wants to start shut down the internet there is because there is a big peaceful demonstration protesting the rational discrimination of the Papuan people in uh, Surabaya and Malang. The big demonstration is handled with uh, security approaches, deploying the soldiers, many soldiers, to the West Papua, and also they are turning off the internet. Despite seeing how the government can bend the law to its will, in 2020, SafeNet and the Alliance of Independent Journalists took the Indonesian government to court over the 2019 internet shutdowns. 
the basis legal that the government use is Article 40, point A and point B inside the internet law. So once again, we facing the internet law. We try to to challenge this, the government reason that they have the ability to uh, turn off the internet whenever they want because they said that uh, they have the full access to do that. SafeNet and the Alliance of Independent Journalists argue that the internet shutdown was flawed in authority, substance and procedure. What happened from November till June 2020 is we go to the administrative court and then the jury uh, from the administrative court agree with us. So we go to the administrative court and then we are asking that to say that this government, they are abusing the Article 14 inside the internet law. And the judges agreed and then sentenced the defendant one and defendant two. Defendant one is the Ministry of uh, Information and Communication. And then uh, defendant two, the President of Republic of Indonesia, is guilty because of violating their own laws. The work that SafeNet and similar organizations do is important not just from a legal point of view. It is also about advocacy, empowerment, and educating the public. This is the one thing that we try to communicate to the public. If we are only protesting and without challenging the law, saying that this law is not based on good governance and also violating human rights, people will not understand winning the case and also explaining this, giving the public understanding that they have the right of the internet, they have the right to access the information, especially they have the right also to uh, challenge whenever the internet laws is being abused uh, to take out their digital rights. We often think of lawsuits as a civil, respected, and safe recourse to action. Images of judges in full court dress, black robe, collar, and white wig come to mind. But bringing a lawsuit against a government that is already blurring the lines between democratic rule and authoritarianism can be dangerous. Here is Natalia from Access Now again. So unfortunately, we do know of cases uh, a lot of times in sort of uh, close, call them closed, uh, closing countries that are quite difficult in terms of political and social freedoms. Um, so we, we know of cases where plaintiffs or the lawyers have faced intimidation uh, and retribution for challenging the government in court. So we've seen uh, plaintiffs or lawyers uh, being subject to legal or physical intimidation and cyber attacks. In some situations, challenging a government's shutdown order opens new risk for the personal safety of the lawyer or activist. Uh, Judge Emmanuel from Cameroon, I think, is one example uh, where uh, he championed uh, multiple cases uh, in Cameroon at the Supreme Court and Constitutional Council, um, challenging uh, the two internet shutdowns in Cameroon, in Anglophone regions of Cameroon. These shutdowns lasted over 200 days. And um, some cases were dismissed kind of early on, and some are still ongoing. And he did manage to bring some good results. Uh, and also he made one of the telco companies to basically reveal in affidavit to the court that the government was the one, in fact, that ordered the shutdown. But he did face uh, retaliation for his legal actions, and he was summoned, uh, for example, by the government uh, and was subject to questioning and interrogations about the true motives behind his legal actions uh, the government sort of questioned, you know, what was his purpose and who is behind. 
uh, him and who's funding him. So it was quite, uh, from what I understand, um, scary, you know, uh, experience. So I think it's it's a good example, uh, well, unfortunate example of how challenging it can be sometimes to bring these cases opposing shutdowns and standing up uh, to the government in court. It is important to remember that internet shutdowns are always just one part of the story. As we see in Myanmar, the erosion of digital rights can lead to the erosion of other human rights. In Sudan, it was about holding private companies who collaborate with a repressive regime accountable for their actions. When we strengthen our digital rights and fight for them through judicial systems, we set precedents for protecting other rights, both in our own countries and across the world. Join us in the next episode of Kill Switch, in which we'll hear about how internet shutdowns impact the everyday lives of people around the world. For more information about how to support the Keep It On Coalition and our work, visit our website www.accessnow.org. This podcast was produced by Access Now and Volume with funding support from Internews. Our music is by Oman Mori. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and share as widely as possible to help the fight against internet shutdowns. I am your host, Felicia Antonio, and you have been listening to Kill Switch. Goodbye, and remember to keep it on. Keep it on.